Frank, thank you again for joining us today. Obviously, we want to talk to you about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Last time we talked to you, Bitcoin was riding a huge high, closing in almost at 19,000. We've seen that draw. What do you think about that? What do you make of it? Well, I think it's important to recognize that the that Bitcoin world is predominantly a cash world. So it's not really speculative where all big bubbles have been created because it's highly leveraged. Yeah. Real estate crash of 08, the 87 crash was futures market S&P 500. This is predominantly a cash market. In fact, even the Bitcoin uh, contract traded in the futures market, yeah. you can't leverage it. You have to actually have more collateral. So I don't, I'm not all worried about it, but it is a volatile, it's yeah. emergent industry, and it's speculative money. And what I saw is that the these young investors are not really investing, they're all speculators, and it's easier to speculate on a new ICO and opening an account at Coinbase than it is to turn around, uh, open up in a brokerage account to turn around and buy a junior mining. Yep. Most of the, the, the brokerage firms, uh, especially owned by the banks, are pushed back against speculative mining or speculative anything, and there's just the DNA of blood of human beings. They want to be on the latest craze or discovery, yeah. so it's impacting junior mining. So you think long-term fundamentals are looking good for, for Bitcoin. Do you think we'll see the kind of highs that we that we just saw? Yes, I do. And I think yeah. what's really important to recognize is that Bitcoin is to blockchain technology what emails were, was to the internet. Yeah. The internet was slow. It was a dark, sinister place to go. And emails all of a sudden showed the functionality of yeah. it. So Bitcoin is showing the functionality of 24-7 stock trading, moving money around. So they just turn around and remove the word Bitcoin and they can move something else around yeah. with it. Yeah. And I think that that's what's really the key and significant factor in blockchain technology. Mm. Well, it's interesting, Frank. Talk to us a bit about ICOs, initial coin offerings. Do you see those replacing IPOs? Is that is that sort of an either or? Well, for the junior mining space, it clearly has. Uh -huh. uh, it's it, and this is amazing. Look at the numbers and the new coins are coming out, and some are scams. And just like uh, 50 years ago with junior mining and technology, etc., they just were promotion scams. Well, yeah. that's where you have it'll be get cleansed out. And investors just have to be aware of it. But the millennials are something else. And I'll give you a data point. Mm. Schwab took 30 years to amass 3.5 trillion in 10 million accounts. In two years, Coinbase has 13 million accounts. Now, Coinbase doesn't have the dollar punching power of Schwab, but something else is happening, which took 30 years, is less than three years, and it's more people speculating. And they're speculating on these ICOs, or Bitcoin, or Ethereum, yeah. Ethereum Classic, I can go on with a list of the names, but that's the, the, the big revolution, and it's outside of the normal securities world. What really, to me, is important is when it happens when they come over to the stock side. And we're seeing that with Hive. Hive blockchain technology all of a sudden started seeing those millennials that never bought a stock because there was no direct play buying Hive. Yeah. Now, hopefully, other stocks will be going public in the space and other stories, so it's been revitalized in the Canadian capital markets outside of marijuana deals. Well, you mentioned Hive has just closed a $115 million financing. What's on the agenda? What are we looking at for, for the company over the next? It's really impressive, the Canadian capital markets, yeah. that in one quarter we could raise at three different price levels almost $200 million. I mean, that's really remarkable. That's like raising $2 billion for a startup in the U.S. Uh, and with that, we're going to have our revenue this time next year. Now, there's lots of caveats. What is the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum? But based on today's prices and based on the cost of mining those currencies today, that, and, and the performance suggests that we would have potential to be 300 million in revenue, 150 million in cash flow, and close to 100 million in free cash flow. Now that means there's lots of upside. Mm -hmm. Frank, let me ask you about gold. We've seen gold um, do really well at the beginning of the year. Is that sort of a byproduct of people returning from Bitcoin and going back into gold? Or is it really an either or debate? Should we be looking at it differently? Yes, gold is, there's no real debate between gold and Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin doesn't work if there's no electricity. Yeah. Then I think of San Juan with the hurricane, yeah. it was worthless. Mm -hmm. uh, what worked was US dollars and gold and silver coins if you had to buy food or water. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this, it's a part of the early investors, the early gold bug adopters, they never sold the gold to buy Bitcoin. They just diversify having one or 2% in it. Uh, and what, what I think is really important for investors to recognize, gold has outperformed the S&P two to one since the beginning of this century. Yeah. 
like two to one. And last year was up 12%. Yeah. Those are great numbers. But the general media always talks down gold as being negative and it's more volatile. It's the same volatility as the S&P 500. So I think that gold is so undervalued. I think that gold has a lot on the upside. And the big picture is going to be inflation. Inflation is going to start rising. Walmart gets a tax break. What do they do? They increase the minimum wage to $11 a U.S. for all their workers. So we're going to start this, this traction. And there's a debate of the Federal Reserve that they're not properly tracking inflation. Yeah. If they went back to the 1990 model, we have 8% inflation. Yeah. That means rates can go higher, that means gold should be at $5,000 an ounce. So it's just recognizing there's something happened in the calculation of what CPI is, and I'm a big believer CPI is much higher. Yeah. Do you have a, a price target in mind for gold, yeah. where you think it might be? So the DNA, the yeah. DNA of volatility, managing expectations is plus or minus 20% over any rolling 12 month period. So it's a non-event last year when I said gold would go through 1300 and it closed to 1350. Yep. I think it goes to 1500 and that would be just a normal move in the price, wouldn't be extreme. If it was to in one year go to 1900, that would be a much more extreme move. Well, Frank, let's close off. Give us an idea of what stocks are on your radar right now. Well, we launched in Canada GoGo, -Go, yes. which is a smart beta and intelligent ETF. And we spent 8,000 hours doing regression analysis to create this, and it outperforms the other ETFs, and they're picking these gold stocks 90% of the time in rolling 12 month period. So, GoGo, -Go, with the royalty companies like Franco Nevada and Silver Precious, I think that that's just a great product for people to look at. Now, when it comes to the junior mining, you want to speculate? Mm -hmm. Look at copper stocks. I think copper go to $5. If this blockchain technology and electrifying the world and Tesla cars and all this stuff, you need copper. Yeah. And there's going to be lots of strikes this year in Chile. And so copper is, supply is going to be slowing down. The global economy is rising. Copper stocks trade higher. So Copper Bank would be one of my little micro cap specs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you again, Frank. Appreciate your time. Thank you. The opportunity. Cheers.